Welcome everyone to Michigan Birding 101, our fall refresher series. This is the series where we go back over some of the stuff we covered this spring, go a little more in depth in a few areas. And today we're going to be covering, covering fall backyard bird ID and habitat. We're going to be talking about a few different things today. We're going to have some quick intros. Um, I'm going to cover a little bit about fall backyard birds, um, what you can expect to see, what might look a little different. We're not going to go over everything. You can look back at our spring birding 101 for our uh, backyard bird class, but we're going to go a little more in depth and cover one of my favorite groups, the uh, blackbirds. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what you can do to make your backyard a safe place for birds and how to um, quick refresher and how to feed the birds safely. And then Cindy is going to talk us for a while about gardening planning and how you can make a healthy habitat in your backyard. And we'll leave you at the end with a few native plant resources. So let's dive right into that. And do remember again that uh, we have the chat feature available <coughs> for you to share resources, answer questions, get your questions answered though through the Q&A feature. That's the other feature where you wanna ask your questions. All right, so I wanna start off with a little poll here. So I'm gonna launch this poll and I want you to tell me how much Great Lakes coastline is there? Is there the same as the New England Atlantic coastline? So from like Massachusetts up, or is it the same as the Gulf of Mexico, right? Florida, Texas, Louisiana, don't want to miss that little chunk of um, Mississippi there. Uh, but, or is it uh, around the same as the entire Atlantic coastline? Or is it the same as the entire Atlantic coastline plus the entire Gulf? How much shoreline do we have in the Great Lakes? It's kind of getting at how big are the Great Lakes and really how much shoreline do we have there? So we got a spread, but I'm surprised. This is a question a lot of people don't get right. I had no idea until a few years ago, but the correct answer um, survey says it is actually the same as the U.S. Atlantic coastline and the Gulf of Mexico combined. Yes, folks, the state of Michigan is truly impressive. We have a massive amount of shoreline in Michigan and the whole Great Lakes together, um, you know, is over 5,000 miles of Great Lakes shoreline, but Michigan alone has 3,000 miles. It's an incredible resource we have right here. We have more coastline than any other state other than Alaska. This is at low tide, so there's that caveat there. Uh, but uh, we have a ton of amazing water resources in our state, and that's why I am super excited that I get to work for Michigan Sea Grant. We're an organization that helps foster economic growth and protect Great Lakes coastal resources throughout the state through research, education, and outreach. Uh, and so we do education classes, we fund research, we do research, and we also work one-on-one -on -one with businesses and um, communities and nonprofits and whoever needs our help. Um, and we're, we, we are uh, funded by these three agencies. So just wanted to give that little shout out to who we are and why we're doing this. And why are we doing this, you might say? Well, uh, why are we doing a bird class if we care about the Great Lakes? Because those two things are intimately connected. But before I do that, um, I want to give another poll to you. How many bird species have been seen in the state of Michigan? If you remember back to last week, I said how many species we're seen in the fall, spring, and winter. So if you can remember those numbers, it might give you a hint. I also have 450 on there twice. I don't know why. <laughs> I keep forgetting to change that. It should be 350 for C, but we'll just leave 450 on there twice. Uh, so 150, 250, 450, or 450. How many bird species do we have in the state of Michigan? And survey says... It is over 450, 450 it was, uh, I think in 2022 or 2021, but there's actually been a few more species added since then. Um, so we're a little over 450 now. That's a lot of bird species in this state. And as I said, they are intimately connected um, to the Great Lakes. There's 450 species um, that have been seen, 237 that breed in Michigan, like the Kirtland's warbler, which breeds almost nowhere else in the world. Um, and of course, not all of those will be in your backyard, but at any point you may see 10 to 30 species in your own backyard. Um, now, these birds are really intimately connected to the Great Lakes because they provide us ecosystem services. Birds that nest on islands, for example, poop on those islands. And although that poop might kill the vegetation for a while, it actually adds nutrients. So when our Great Lakes water levels go down, new islands are sometimes 
exposed and birds are part of the reason that nutrients can be added back to those islands to make them lush green living places. Birds spread seeds when they eat seeds. Um, a lot of times they'll pass through their digestive tracts and some of our forests is predicted over half of every tree is there because a bird pooped the seed in that forest. Um, so they provide us services. Um, this is a barn swallow. Barn swallows can eat thousands of mosquitoes in a few weeks. Uh, if you want to have less mosquitoes on your property and other pests, encourage birds to be around. Birds are awesome pest managers. They help balance out our food webs. They provide us so many services. Birds are also uh, a great way to keep track of the health of the Great Lakes. So one of the longest running contaminant studies in the world is right here in the Great Lakes with herring gall eggs. So they look for things called PCBs and mercury and other contaminants and um, herring galls live for a while and um, those contaminants accumulate in their flesh. And so we can actually use those as an indicator of how contaminated our Great Lakes are anymore. Cormorants are another species that um, build contaminants. And so we can track them. It's really hard to measure those contaminants in the environment, but birds are way, places that they accumulate. And so this study is one of the most prominent studies in the world for bioaccumulation and for contaminant tracking. And it's right here in the Great Lakes. Um, birds are also an important part of our Great Lakes economy. Birders spent over 41 billion, yes, billion with a B dollars in 2011 on just travel and expenses, not even counting things like uh, bird seed or all the backyard stuff you have. This is just going out to see birds and that's a lot of money. And that was in 2011. That number is probably almost doubled, I would guess, by this point, because there are a lot of more birders since COVID. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so it's a really important economic part. So anyway, that's just my little plug about why birds matter to the Great Lakes. We have a ton of birds that rely on the Great Lakes. The birds themselves provide services to the Great Lakes and to our state. And um, the birds are an economic opportunity. I didn't even touch on hunting, which is a super, another important economic activity. Uh, and waterfowl hunting um, really generates a lot of dollars for conservation. All right, so there's my little spiel. Birds and the Great Lakes, they're connected. And Sea Grant, we care about the Great Lakes, so we care about birds. Now. Let's get into what you came here for. Uh, ah, yeah, somebody's got this one right off the bat, a common grackle, a beautiful bird. Um, and so fall backyard birds uh, are, are quite similar, actually. This is the good news. And uh, fall backyard birds really don't change that much uh, from what we see in the summertime and in the springtime. But there are some species that are going to change their plumage. And so we're going to spend a little time talking about a couple of those um, groups that do that. Uh, before that, though, I want to do another sound ID. So this one's a little different. I just threw this in here for fun. This is going to be a little tough. But no, uh, you might know what some of these birds already sound like. And so I'm going to play the call and um, give it a second. We'll just listen. That might be a little faint, but we're hearing a, a high-pitched squeaky noise. All right. Now, if you know what this bird is, put it in the chat. What we're hearing is a high-pitched squeak, high pitched squeaky noise. That uh, red-winged blackbird calling is not the bird we want to focus on. Rather, this sounds like a squeaky toy. Now, you might be saying to yourself, I have no idea what bird that is, but do you remember what bird C is? That's a sandhill crane. And we heard that call the other week. Was that the sandhill crane call? How about a Canada goose? Was that a Canada goose? You know a Canada goose. And then D, that's a mallard there in the non-breeding plumage. So they don't really have the green heads that much this time of year. Um, and A is a blue winged teal. So what's your guess? Let's see. Some of you are throwing guesses in the chat. Ah, we've got a lot of guesses for A and a few for D. That's appropriate too. Good guesses. This is definitely a duck species and is actually the blue winged teal. So blue winged teals make this wonderful uh, high pitched squeaky noise. And I just wanted to throw this in there to remind you how good of a birder you probably already are. Even if you got this wrong, no worries at all. Uh, but you know, you do know what a goose sounds like, right? And you know what a mallard sounds like. It's the classic quack, quack, quack quack, quack, right? Um, and maybe now since last week, we listened to the Sandhill Crane, that rolling, um, majestic call, loud, boisterous um, cranes. You know those three. So if you're in a field and you see those three, but you hear a squeak, 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 you'll know, hey, wait, it's not a common call. It's something different. I just want to point out that when you hear a bird that sounds really unique, that might be a good time to 
peel your eyes on peel your eyes on it and get a good glimpse of something really cool and unique like the blue winged teals one of our, our most beautiful species of ducks all right um so we're going to go back to practicing and please don't say what species this is so do not type in the chat right now what species this is we're going to work on our field id skills again today a little bit we're going to go through a quick couple of species here. And we're going to focus on the fall plumage for some of these species. So what I want you to do first is to just tell me some observations. You don't have to type that in the chat, but if you want, you can tell us some observations. Don't tell us what species, um, but rather, what do you notice about this bird? What are some things that stick out to you? And remember, when we do this, we want to focus on structure. Okay, so what are some particular shapes? Um, we also want to focus on relative size. So you could call it a small bird if you want, or a big bird. It might be hard to tell from this photo. Um, but maybe talk about this length of the bill uh, compared to the size of the head, or the length of the tail compared to the size of the body. Um, maybe some things about how far the wings project. Um, patterns are also very important. Ah, yes. B was uh, notices that there's a notch in the tail. That's a really important one. Yeah, um, short pointed beak. Yeah, it's a very pointed beak and it's not very long, right? It's kind of stubby, almost cone-like in some ways. It has those wing stripes back, very good there. Um, yeah, it's got those very prominent wing stripes on there. Um, we're also, uh, also uh, uh, Pesca said wing bars as well. That's what we call those wing stripe, wing bars. It has a dark eye, yeah. It's perching, that's great. That's a little bit about behavior, right? Um, it's also kind of structure, but also behavior. It's got that perching legs that are grasping onto something. It's not walking on the ground. Um, it doesn't have the kind of talons necessarily, but it's perching there. So that's great, this is a perching bird. Of course, it's got a gold yellow ahead. That is, a, that is an important feature, right? Um, color does matter, even though color can be deceptive. Um, when you see those colors prominently, it's important to note them. So these would all be great things that you could mark down in a notepad or real quick take an audio note on your phone when you see a bird that you don't know what it is. You really want to take some of those features in a note. Also, some of that black, right? You got black, white, black on the wings, black on the back, black on the tail, um, and more of a kind of buff on the belly and back there. So um, yeah, good, 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 good job, folks. So so um, does anyone I had to guess what group of birds this belongs in? Not the species, but what group of birds might have these? Um, a, a few keys here are it's a perching bird. So that puts it in the overall group of, of songbirds or passerines. Um, but it also has that bill that's very almost cone-like, right? Kind of stubby. And there's only a, a few groups that have that kind of shorter stubby bill. That kind of rules out things. I mean, clearly it's not a waterfall, it's not a shorebird. Um, it rules out though things like raptors. This is not a raptor. It rules out things like crows and blackbirds. Those have much longer bills, so it's not a blackbird or crow. Um, it even rules out things like uh, warblers, which tend to have more narrow beaks. So yes, Kermit <laughs> is what your, your Zoom name says there. It said it's a finchy beak, and that is what group this is. This bird is a type of finch. Um, the other you know, one that maybe you would have been led to is sparrows. Sparrows also kind of have um, kind of more stubby bills a lot of times too. So sparrows and finches are pretty close, but this is a finch. Um, and so if we look into our bird book, this is from the Sibley Guide to the Birds. These are all the finches of North America, so not even all the ones we have here. And when you start to look for those kind of features, well, we're looking for those two prominent wing bars. So a few of the things that we might have are, you know, pine grosbeaks have those prominent wing bars. Uh, white wing crossbills have those prominent wing bars. And then a couple of species of the goldfinches, Lawrence goldfinch and American goldfinch seem to have those prominent wing bars. Now, if we combine that with our note about that kind of conical bill. Well, the crossbill has a crossbill, so we can cross off the crossbill. <laughs> the pine gross beak is pretty chunky uh, and also has a little bit of a curve in that bill, whereas this is pretty straight. Um, so there's a bit of a curve in that bill there. Um, so that kind of gets us down to the, uh, the, fin the goldfinches. So if we open up our page uh, to the goldfinches, there's really only three species of goldfinches. And if we look down at the notes, we see Okay, uh, there's a couple of these that would be very rare here. So you can throw it in the chat. What species is this? I think a few of you have pictured it out. It is an American goldfinch. And this is definitely a non-breeding bird. Um, could be a male. I, I'm not exactly sure if it's a male or a female, but it's uh, because when they're non-breeding, they look pretty similar, but there definitely may be a way to tell them apart. Um, 
the the non-breeding male can have more, I guess, yellow sometimes, but they can look very similar. So um, <laughs> this is a winter or non-breeding plumage goldfinch. And goldfinches, although we think of them as such a bright and colorful bird, even the females have quite a bit of yellow, in the winter months, they get a lot more subdued. Now, this is why it's so important to focus on things like pattern and structure, because some of those things don't change. In particular, structure is always going to be the same, even though a bird may completely lose its feathers and get new ones. That cone-like bill, that conical, very, you know, almost like a perfect triangle um, <coughs> size bill, that does not change, right? The general overall, uh, the, uh, the perching ability of this bird, that does not change, even though the colors will change. The length of the tail with a nice V notch in it, uh, which I forgot to note again, that, that's a great feature that will not change even if the bird's colors change. And so when it comes to fall ID, one of the things you want to really remember is that we can't just rely on color. We need to also focus on structure and behavior and habitat and even just what birds should be in my area. What are the common things? And this can help us kind of narrow down when we see something that really throws us off that um, we're like, ah, oh, that looks like this common bird I know, you know, I see yellow rumped warblers all the time. And it used to confuse me so much until I kind of realized a yellow rumped warbler in the fall is just basically toned down version of the spring one. Um, that's what a lot of these fall plumages are. They're just kind of a dialed back version of the spring one. And so when you kind of keep that in mind, it can be helpful to sort of get uh, a little bit good, better at figuring out these fall birds. So this is a common backyard bird. Um, and here's some of the other finches, uh, in case you're you're wondering. This is something we covered in our spring class. Um, but you might start to see pine siskins. This is an eruptive species that sometimes shows up in the fall, some not every fall. Uh, but I love these little birds. They're kind of very sparrow-like. And they're, they kind of break the mold for a finch because their bills are a little bit na more narrow. Um, <laughs> sort of cross between like a warbler and a finch bill. Um, but those are beautiful species that are still technically finches, and uh, they have that nice uh, yellow wing bar, which is pretty distinctive. You also got your purple finches and your house finches that may be coming in. And if you're lucky, uh, in a few months, probably late fall, early winter, red poles are another eruptive species that may show up at your feeder. So just a quick recap of the finches that are most likely um, to show up at your backyard. All right, let's get a little bit more about this bird here. So let's do it again. What are we noticing about this species? Give me some of your observations. This is another pretty common migrant bird that would show up at feeders, but looks a little different in the fall, or, or some of them at least, than they would in the spring. So we've got our first uh, feature here. Oh yes, uh, so Cindy reminds us, do not share the name, but yes, just some features like, um, M. Petska here, light colored pale beak. Yes, it has a little bit of a pale beak. The eye stripe, very prominent eye stripe and head stripe. Fairly long tail. Yeah, that's a really good one there, Kermit. Um, uh, Leah, stripe on top of the head and on the eyes, right? Those stripes on the head are very important. Uh, TK, that's a good note there. It's kind of got a bit of a tuft to its head and, and, and that can change based on posture, but when you see it, it can definitely help. Um, the wings sit low. That's a good one too. Um, and again, that can change based on posture, but, uh, and those wings, they're not very long, right? They barely make it to the tail. Um, that stripe through the eye is really, really important. And that skinny long tail also helps us a bit here. Um, so these are all good features. Um, you know, some other things to note, uh, you know, this bird is again, a perching bird. It's got those skinny legs that are nice, good for grasping. It's got those stubby wings and the long tail, but the head is really the key here. And you've already all caught into that, but I will note, look, this has got a brown stripe and then more of a cream white stripe in the middle. So it's white, brown, white here and then brown, and that's kind of where the stripes end. Um, and so that's a little bit uh, unique there, but that head pattern is really key and head patterns for this group of birds are super important. Um, if you remember back to our spring class, um, this group of birds, I showed you just a bunch of their faces because if you can look at the heads and focus on there and really pay attention to where those lines are. Is there a, a head stripe? Is there an eye stripe? Is there what we call a mustache stripe or mallard? Um, you know, where are those stripes specifically and what's the order of them? That can really help. So does anybody know what group of birds this is? You can throw that in the chat if you do. Um, these are birds that have generally longer tails than the finches, but still kind of that cone 
cone-like bill. It's not normally very long. Um, this group of birds is also always, almost always not colorful. They are, as Taylor just pointed out, the sparrows. Nice job, Taylor. Um, so this is a sparrow and Zeke just got that there too at the same time. Nice. Um, so this is a sparrow. Sparrows are the brown streaky, streaky birds or the little brown birds, uh, little brown birds, LBJs, is what we sometimes call them. And these birds can be really tough. Um, and, and even harder in the fall, but you're already picking up on some good patterns here. So like I said, face pattern is what's really important. So if we open up the sparrows, this is from the Sibley Guide to the Birds again. I like to use it because it has these um, plates that show out all the sparrows at once. And I, I even like Sibley because they don't show the breeding plumage. They actually do show the fall plumage. So we're looking for a bird that has an eye stripe. Well, that's a lot of birds <laughs> that are on this page, but it does not have the mustache stripe. So a bird that doesn't have the mallard stripe is a little more unique. Um, you know, that... Uh, for example, this rufous wing sparrow has the eye stripe and the head stripe, but it's got that mallard stripe, the, the black stripe that goes down there. Um, American tree sparrow might be one that could fit the bill here. Uh, it's kind of got a pinkish uh, bill. It's got that eye stripe and the head stripe. Um, you know, another one, the field sparrow, it's kind of got the eye stripe, the head stripe, not much going on. Um, the white crown sparrow and the golden crown sparrow are a couple others that have the eye stripe and the head stripe. Um, and so it kind of helps us narrow down when we really focus on those stripes and the facial pattern. Uh, and so we're going to get this uh, over to, I'm just going to kind of move us along here to what's a little more likely. And what's a little more likely is uh, basically the this group here. So these are the, uh, I can never say this genus name right, but the Zanortri. Kia, Jizana trichia, the Z, the Z sparrows. These are kind of bigger sparrows with nice long tails, kind of chunky bodies. Um, and as you can see here, um, this probably is pretty easy to pick out, but um, the bird that doesn't tend to have as much of that mallard stripe would be the white crown sparrow. Now I wanted to throw this one in there um, to help you kind of think through sparrows. Again, these are the little brown birds with lots of streaks, but if we can focus on those head patterns, that can really help us. And you'll notice that the the taiga version, which is the kind of tundra, um, this is the subspecies we have here in the east. The they basically the young birds or first winter birds don't tend to have the white and black stripes on the head, rather brown and white or brown and cream colored stripes. And this is kind of again to kind of point out that in the fall, what you're also going to get besides fall plumage birds are young birds, right? In the summer, birds breed. There are there are thousands, millions more birds now than there were uh, last spring. A lot of these birds won't make it through the winter. Uh, but the young are out there and they're migrating. And those young birds are going to look different than the adult birds. Young birds in their first year of life generally have a unique plumage that's a little bit different. But again, it's kind of like fall plumage. It's a dialed back version of the adult plumage. And this is to give the bird maybe a little more camouflage advantage in the fall. Um, you know, in that first year of life, maybe they don't tend to have the really bright colors that make them a little bit more of a target for predators. Um, and so this one here, the white crown sparrow, these are going to be coming through in the later part of fall for most of you. Uh, I'm starting to see some around here, but even for me in the UP, they're not quite here yet um, in big numbers. But by the end of September, you'll be seeing these big flocks of white crown sparrows, sometimes white throated sparrows, which I have over here on the right will be mixed in. Um, and then you'll also get chipping sparrows in those groups and song sparrows. But I really love the sparrows, but they can be really challenging. Um, but again, if you kind of just focus on those head features, it can really help. And here's a great image from a uh, now kind of defunct app called uh, Birdface. Although there's still a Facebook page and you can get these images there. There's another very similar Im image on the American Birding Association website. And this kind of shows you again, some of those uniqueness to the head, the head um, patterns on these birds. And again, it's those stripes, right? So white, black, white, black, these are for adult birds um, versus you know the white throated sparrow that has white, black, white, black, and then a white throat and a little yellow dot. Um, so all these kind of minutia details, when you kind of focus on them, you start to learn them, you realize, wow, they are quite different, really. None two of them have the exact same pattern or really not even, I mean, close, but not that close. I always used to struggle with um, American tree sparrow and chipping sparrow until I finally realized that chipping sparrows have a white eye line and tree sparrows don't. And 
they because they look almost exactly the same. But when you realize that that white eye line, it really does stick out on a chipping sparrow, whereas a tree sparrow has a gray eye line um, and or gray above the eye line. So anyway, just another little throwing out there. The sparrows, they're challenging. There are a lot of them in the fall, um, but they're a lot of fun when you, especially when you use these kind of images here. Don't forget to be throwing questions in the chat if you have any questions. Um, I, I will get to those when we get to the end, or sorry, not in the chat, in the Q&A. Uh, let's go on to another uh, quiz here. I'm gonna share a screen one more time. And this is a sound quiz. So this one's really challenging. I have no idea if anyone will get this or not, but I just wanted to throw in some of these species that we just uh, covered. So you can see A is our white crown sparrow and uh, C is the uh, American goldfinch. If you know B or D, feel free to throw those in the chat. Um, they're a little bit harder, but B is a bird that we covered last week in a more adult plumage. And this is a juvenile bird or a non-breeding, um, you know, a juvenile bird generally, B there. Uh, it has white outer tail feathers. It's got a pale bill and normally it's a lot more gray. That bird B there is the dark-eyed junco. And uh, D is the house finch, a common bird at feeders. So I'm gonna see if you know the call of this bird. So we got a few guesses. I'll play it one more time. All right, that's a really hard one, but some of you have got it down. So that kind of light um, musical notes and kind of staccato-y um, rapid beats are common for finches. And that is the goldfinch, as many of you said. So they have a rapid call note. And this is different than the song that they will make in the summer. So I wanted to point this one out to just point out that birds have different calls for different times of the year. Um, so a, a goldfinch is a very musical, melodic, uh, long summer call, but their flight call which is what most birds are making this time of year, is really different. And it's that kind of staccato-y, faster one. Um, so just pointing that out there and um, impressed that some of you knew that. That was a really, really hard one. If you didn't know that, do not feel bad at all. It takes a long time to learn the calls. All right, uh, here's another one. This will be our last ID recap for the day today, but I really love this species of bird. So again, uh, you can just throw a couple of quick observations in the chat there if you want. Um, this bird is a lot different. Um, and yes, there are a lot of these. These can be in big flocks right now. Um, so long, dark beak. Well, this is really changing up the beak shape here, right? It's maybe even got a bit of a curve to it. Um, yellow eye, that's a really good one there. That actually is gonna be really important for this group. Um, yeah, you know, it's kind of crow-like. I, I think sometimes comparing a bird to similar bird species that we know, it can be really helpful and a very strong bill. Yeah, um, it's got a little bit of, of, of uh, bare skin around the eye. Now that you would normally not see that, but this is a really good picture. Um, it has kind of a blue head and neck, although, um, you know, depending on lighting, this could what we call generally um, iridescence, right? So it has iridescent feathers on the head and neck, um, like Carol just said there. So it's iridescent and it has generally like a bluish greenish on the head, purplish and more of a brownish goldish on the back. Um, it has a really long tail too. That's a really, really helpful one there. So these are all really, really good features for this kind of generally group of birds that people find really challenging. Um, does anybody know what group of birds this belongs to? Um, this is a blackbird, Jennifer. Yes, this is the blackbird. So this blackbird, um, there are actually only a handful of blackbird species that we have in the state of Michigan. And um, even though they may come in in big flocks and a lot of people find that to be distasteful, they, they wish that their bird um, bird feeders weren't getting drained so fast. Um, there's a lot to love with this group of bir birds. They are really fascinating. And there are actually more species than people realize. So our group species that we would have in Michigan include the red winged blackbird, the common grackle, 
the brown-headed cowbird, and the rusty blackbird, and also the brewer's blackbird. I'm not going to cover brewer's blackbird today because it is rather rare for most parts of the state. It's unlikely you'd see them. So these are the primary species that breed in Michigan and regularly move through here. You'll see that the um, Ictheridae, this group of birds, also includes meadowlarks and um, Walt and Orioles, uh, which are totally differently colored. So um, they're not as hard to differentiate. Um, now this, this bird in particular here, um, which one do we think it is? So we're looking at that iridescence, but also that bill shape is really key. It's a very heavy bill. And if you wanna put it in the chat, you can throw out your guess as to what species you think this is. Um, you know, We see that the red winged blackbird, at least for this one, is very streaky. There's not a lot of streaks on our bird. Um, the brown-headed cowbird has a much more muscular and almost finch-like bill, so we can cross that off. And that has a yellow eye, so we can cross off the brewer's blackbird, which really only leads rusty and grackle. And our guesses are coming in mostly for grackle. So let me throw up the two that I just said that have the yellow eyes. There's only two species that have yellow eyes, um, the common grackle and the rusty blackbird. Now you can see from this image, some of those key features that you were saying. Um, they're both iridescent in, in at least the adult plumages. So the adult rusty blackbird, the adult males, and um, pretty much most of the um, adult um, grackles, although not the juveniles, are gonna be iridescent and glossy. And they both have yellow eyes, but the um, common grackle has that bill that's a lot heavier, um, that heavy bill, and then a longer tail, a much longer tail that is not shaped the same. The tail of the grackle actually is scooped, which you can see really well. Again, this is the Sibley Guide to the Birds. Sibley, please don't sue me for using your images. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's really helpful um, to show that the middle feathers of a grackle's tail are actually longer than the outer feathers. Whereas the club shaped tail of a, a rusty blackbird is, gives it a more smooth uniform appearance. So rack, common grackles have scoop tails and rusty blackbirds have club tails um, or spoon tails versus club tails is one way to remember it. And then that bill shape is pretty different which gives it some unique features. The rusty blackbird also in the female and non-breeding plumages will have rusty fringes to the edge or sometimes even a very rufous color like the female non-breeding ones up here. Um, so again, these are the only blackbirds that have yellow eyes, the rusty blackbird and the common grackle. And so that's a quick way to differentiate the kind of two major groups, uh, the rusty blackbird and the um, common grackle or the yellow eyes where the other ones have dark eyes. So here's a, a summary of all your blackbirds. And when you get that big blackbird flock in your yard th this year, I want you to try to differentiate what species because they like to be in mixed species flocks. And this is what makes um, blackbirds so fun to me. Even though they mess up all my feeders, and they eat all my feed really fast. I love trying to find that needle in the haystack. The most rare of these is the rusty blackbird, which actually has seen its population declined. I think something like 75, 80% of the population of rusty blackbirds in the US has disappeared. Um, some unknowns there, um, but it's becoming rare. And, and so when I see a black, blackbird flock, I'm always looking for those rusty blackbirds trying to find that needle in the haystack. Um, but even the grackles are fun to look at because they have variation. The females are a little bit smaller than the males. And so you can start to pick up on size differences even within the species. Um, but again, these are your two yellow-eyed ones, the common grackle and the rusty blackbird. Now, um, the other one we have, of course, is the red winged blackbird, the male you probably know with that red wing. But you also have the females and young that are streaky, brown, streaky, like a sparrow almost. But again, they still have that pretty well-defined, longer knife-like blackbird, classic blackbird bill. The brown-headed cowbird is a really unique blackbird because it has a much uh, more uh, squat features to it. It has a, a shorter neck and it has a more robust bill that's a little more cone-like. And the females are kind of all dull where the males have that brown head. 
And then you have not really a blackbird, but the European starling will also be mixed in there. And these guys have the, the longest bill, but it's still sort of that same general structure, that kind of knife-like bill. And they will either be iridescent, but almost always with some at, le at least some white flecking in there. Also, some of them have a yellow bill, which makes them pretty easy to identify. And their structure is a little bit different. So again, we got the two yellow eyes, the common grackle and the rusty blackbird which you can tell apart by the shape of the tail and the shape of the bill. You have the red wing blackbird, um, which has either a red wing or is very brown and streaky. And then you have the cowbird, which is a lot more squat, it has a shorter neck and a heavier bill, um, a brown head too, or all dull. And then of course the European starling, which is pretty unique. So I wanted to cover these because I got a few more quizzes here for you. Before you so, move on, before you yeah. move on, um, can you tell what family is the starling in? Ooh, that's a good question. So starlings are uh, from Europe. They are not native to the U.S. And so because they're from another continent, they're kind of in their own family. Um, I'm not sure if it's today is in multiple continents or not, um, but the European starling is in the uh, Sternus family, the Sternus family. So they're grouped with um, birds that we don't have a lot of here, like minas. Uh, but in your bird book, you'll find them between thrashers and wagtails. But they're really just kind of a unique group that we don't have much of in North America um, since they're not from here. One other question, uh, just had a question about not understanding when you say group of birds. So how many groups are there and is there a master list? Yeah, so it depends on what level you're looking at. So if you remember back to your biology class, you have phylum, kingdom, or, or kingdom phylum, um, you know, uh, orders, genus, species, families. I didn't do that in the right order, but you have different ways that we group life into bigger and then more and more specific groups. Um, and so uh, sometimes we are talking about genus, which is one step above species. And sometimes we're talking about family, which is one step above that. Um, there's birders are not great at sticking to just family or genus or order. Uh, we kind of throw around a lot of different terms. So your best bet is to get a good field guide, a good bird book, and it will have your birds grouped in different groups. Um, you know, you'll have your waterfowl, your shorebirds, your raptors. And as you kind of study your book, you'll kind of pick up on what those groups are that birders often refer to. Um, you can learn the science ones, but birders kind of, again, go more off of what the guides do rather than the science. All right, well, with that, um, we'll have some more time for questions at the end, but I wanna kind of move us along here just so Cindy can get started here in a minute. Um, how many species of blackbirds are in this photo? That's a, a quick, quick quiz. How many species do we have here? Any guesses? So this is what a mixed blackbird flock looks like. If it's nice in your backyard and really close, We've got a few guesses coming in. We've got four, four, two, two, four, two. <laughs> All right. And three, two, three. The correct answer is three. So we have three species here. We have males and females of one species, which is where I think a lot of people are getting four from. And this is a little tough, but you've got a couple obvious ones here, right? You've got our nice, big, really heavy bill, yellow eye. So that one is our common grackle. And then you've got that really long yellow bill. Um, that one there is our European starling. The other one, which is kind of a more out of focus, um, would be the brown-headed cowbird. And this is the male that has the brown head. And this is the female that has the kind of all dull tan on there. So nice. You're picking up on some of the differences here on blackbirds. Good. Even if you didn't know what species, if you knew there was more than one species of blackbird, you know more than most of the average uh, U.S. citizen knows about blackbirds. All right. This is another one. This one's a tough one. How many species are in this photo? Remember the males and females look different in some of our species. Anybody wanna throw any guesses how many species in this photo? I'll give you a second. There's a lot to look at in this one. Blackbirds descend on farm fields too as, as much as they do into our yards. So we've got one, five, two, Three, 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 
two, five. All right, so we're definitely picking up on there's different species here, right? Again, we've got our nice yellow-eyed iridescent common grackles here and here. You can see how those colors shift based on the lighting. That's what we talk about with iridescence. Um, these are all common grackles here. We have our red, red winged blackbird. We've got the more obvious males with the red on the wing, like here or here. But we also have the streaky young birds, like this is a young male here or a young female over here. So the streaky birds are also red winged blackbirds. And then we've got a few sneaky uh, brown headed cowbirds in there. We've got one here and one over here with his brown head and his chunky bill. So I'm picking up on three species. If anybody no noticed a different one or another one, and those of you that said five, that totally makes sense because the males and females of the red wing and the males and females of uh, you know the brown headed cowbirds can look really different. Here's the female brown headed cowbird. Uh, and so that is you know a tough one to remember those males and females, uh, but you're doing good, nice. All right, uh, this last one, Last one, and then we'll move on to backyards a bit here. How many species are in this photo? This is a tough one, but we've seen maybe a species that looks a little different than before. I've got some guesses for one, two, three, two, two, two. And the correct answer is... Two, there are two species of blackbirds in this photo. So again, our nice, oh, actually, I just realized I was wrong. There's three, <laughs> there's three species. There was a sneaky one in there. So this is our common grackle. Again, you can see that nice heavy bill. And also I threw in another picture here um, that I wanted to show really quick has that scooped tail, right? This is another common grackle here. Um, so it has that scooped tail with the longer feathers in the middle, but that really iridescent and that really heavy bill and the yellow eye. Now we have other birds with yellow eyes here, but their tails are not scooped. They're more club shaped and they have this rusty fringe on there. So these would be our rusty blackbirds. I totally missed it, but right here, and some of you seem to have catched on this. There is a sneaky red winged blackbird. You can just see the leading edge of that red wing. And also their bill shape is a little bit, um, a little bit fatter than the rusty and the common grackle. So nice job, folks. Um, I, I know that this can be overwhelming at times, uh, but I hope it made you excited to look a little bit closer at these big flocks of blackbirds that are gonna be in your backyards over the next month. All right, with that, uh, we're going to move on. Just as a reminder, it's okay not to ID every bird and have fun. That's what this is all about. Um, but I'm going to kind of fast forward us here a bit so we can get to um, some of the things that Cindy's got for us. Uh, but just as a reminder, this is from our, our spring class, some things you can do to help these migrating birds. So right now, as we talked about last time, there are millions of birds flying over every day. A few days ago, I think I looked at the report, it was like 6 million birds flew over Michigan the other day. Um, and as I said, my friend saw 20,000 warblers in, in a matter of hours in the morning the other day. So we have tons of birds, but there are a lot of threats to them. Um, a few things you can do, you can keep your cats inside. Cats are one of the biggest threats to birds. They kill billions of birds every year. If you get a new cat, make it an indoor cat. It's safer for your cat. It's better for your cat and it's better for the environment. Um, you know, no wall up on the windows. You can put out uh, things on your windows to prevent birds from running into them and then turn off your exterior lights at night. Um, this is a really helpful way to stop birds from getting confused during migration. Lights at night um, kind of throw off birds who are trying to use the stars to navigate. So if you have an outdoor light, yes, I know we're all afraid of the dark. It's very scary, um, but you know, try using a motion sensor or a timer on your lights so that they're not on all the time when you're not out there. And that will save you money too. Um, so it's a win-win. And then of course, reducing pesticides and poisons. Now, the other thing you can do in your backyard besides removing threats is provide some things. And Cindy's gonna talk in just a second here about some of the things you can provide. Um, but of course, bird feeders are one of the things you can provide. And this is really important. It's a common misconception that backyard birds won't migrate if you put out food for them. That is wrong. <laughs> that is not true. Most of the birds that are in your backyard are songbirds. And so they're gonna be obligate migrants. They're gonna migrate based on the time of day. So you wanna feed the birds. 
What you don't want to do is feed them, buy stuff that they're not going to eat. So barley, milo, oats, and wheat. This is from Wild Birds Unlimited, a great store in East Lansing. There's a few other around the state. Um, these are things that are in mixes that birds won't eat. They're often in the, the really cheap wild bird mixes. Um, and they're just going to be a waste of your time. They're going to attract mice and other things. Um, but these things, sunflower seeds mainly, as well as safflower, millet, niger, and corn, and peanuts, these are all going to be loved by many birds. The creme de la creme, the top of the top, the cream of the class is the sunflower. Um, safflower is a little more bitter, so birds will probably avoid it unless there's sunflower not present. And then some of your birds will eat it. And as a bonus, um, squirrels don't like it as much. Millet is great for ground birds. Niger is an awesome finch feed. And corn and peanuts are loved by a lot of things like squirrels, chipmunks, blue jays, and grackles. And so when you're trying to feed your little birds, maybe put up a sunflower feeder over in the corner and then put out some corn and peanuts or peanuts on the ground or on a ground feeder rather, um, or in a bigger, more obvious place. And that will kind of provide different feeding opportunities for different types of birds. Um, <clears throat> when you have your feeders out, oh, besides feeder, there's things like nectar. So um, again, this is just a flash uh, review from this spring, but um, you can put out nectar in a four to one solution of water to sugar. You wanna use a refined sugar, don't use organic sugar or honey or syrup. These will not be good for the, uh, um, the hummingbirds. And then suets, fruit, and mealworms. These are all other extra things you can throw out there to attract a bigger diversity of birds. And you wanna leave your nectar out until it starts to freeze because you never know what late hummingbird might really need that extra boost. And sometimes really rare hummingbirds show up in like October when almost every other hummingbird is gone. So you might get that rare one. <clears throat> With all seeds and suet and everything, it can spoil. So you do wanna change that out every once in a while. Like I said, with the nectar, you wanna use a th four to one ratio is probably the best, although three to one can work too. Um, and with suet, uh, you wanna make sure that it's in a proper uh, container. You don't wanna just spread suet out there because if it gets on their feathers, it can harm them, but you could put them in those sewage blocks, uh, suet blocks or um, in a uh, another area. So last but not least, um, you wanna, vary the heights of your feeders and things like that to provide a variety of opportunities. And this will give you space for all your birds. Like here, I have a hanging feeder that the chickadees really like, but I put my corn on my chair here. And on this platform here, you see I have a real low budget situation going on. And I put some corn here for the squirrels and the blackbirds and the blue jays. And that way I can still have my chickadees on the, that feeder that takes a little more work. They're willing to get do the work to get the sunflowers or the other bigger birds just go right for the easy pickings of the corn. And the corn's cheaper too. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Cindy. Okay, thanks, Elliot. We shared this uh, screen before where you see the different elements of a bird-friendly yard. And that's what uh, Elliot has been talking about. And we talked about a lot of this in the spring. What I wanna talk about spe uh, specifically today though, is more about planning your yard for fall and really thinking through your gardening. In the spring, we all get excited. We go to the garden stores, we buy up all the flowers and we put them out. But it's really important to think about planning your garden so that you can make sure you're having things flower all the way through your year. And not everything is showy in spring. So when you go to the garden store in springtime, you might not necessarily, you might be missing out on a really cool plant because of course all the annuals are in bloom and we just get attracted to all the really, the really pretty plants. But a lot of things bloom later and that is really important for our pollinators and our birds uh, to have other food sources besides our feeders. Um, it's really important that you think through what you're gonna do uh, in your garden. And to also remember that gardens take time to get established. This little chart right here, I took some of my basic plants that I have in my garden, and you could do this easily with your own garden. Go through and list your plant names and you can find these, you can find all this information out when you just start searching. You know, uh, the type is, is it an annual or a perennial? I tend to like to have perennials more because annuals just 
take a lot more time and they take because uh, uh, you got to be watering them all the time. And it's also expensive to replace annuals every year. So I tend to use mostly perennials now. But then I chart out when are my um, plants going to be flowering, the main times that they're flowering, you know, so you plant your bulbs. And then in my case, you know, and I know I've talked about this plant before, the Jack Frost Brunera, that comes out uh, early in the spring. It's a great uh, option other than a hosta because the deer and the bunnies don't like it. They don't like the texture of the leaves. Uh, so it's a great replacement for hostas. You know, coral bells bloom out in April, May, June, and July. Uh, of my all-time favorite for an annual is Lantana, um, and it blooms from the time you plant it. This is an annual, though, uh, to plant until October, November, first frost. So it's a fabulous plant. I'll show you a picture of it in a minute where I've got it in a pot. I unfortunately can't plant this in my backyard anymore because it is toxic to dogs, and for some reason I have one dog that just wants to eat it up like crazy. So I've had to remove it from my backyard. Hostas bloom all different times depending on the species, uh, the variety of hosta that you have. So there are some that, you know, you want to mix up your hostas and not necessarily buy all exactly the same hosta and, and look for different sizes and different species because then you get the different uh, blooms at different times. And so I've just done that with all of my plants and I have one, so as you can see, I have them that they go out and plant uh, all the way through the fall. So there's a big difference in my garden between spring and fall. Here's my spring garden. Of course, some of these pictures are from one year to the next, um, where I have all my spring planting. And then in the fall, I've gone through and I've really changed out. This is just this week. Um, I added in uh, New England asters which are a huge, huge uh, butterfly and bee uh, plant. They love them. Um, and you can just see the difference between the, the two looks. Now, what you have to decide as a gardener, if you're going to do any kind of gardening, is what kind of a gardener are you? I tend to be somebody who likes kind of wild looking things. I am not a meticulous gardener. I don't care if there are weeds. I'm doing all of my gardening for the birds and the bees and the butterflies. So I do weed a little bit, but not a whole heck of a lot, I'll be honest. My garden always looks best in the spring <laughs> because I've got it nice and clean and neat. And then by fall over here this last week, it's gotten a little bit a little bit raggedy around the edges. I do want to point out, there's an awesome little plant. This is a, a little shrub called a Caryopteris. That has not yet bloomed. You can see that over in the corner over here, I have a uh, the black-eyed Susans that have bloomed. Um, there's a lot of Brunera in here, a lot of Pachysandra, and of course, just a nice old-fashioned annual with the uh, the geraniums there. The big garden that I have, and not everybody's going to want a big garden. You might just want a little teeny garden, and that's good too. Anything you can do to plant native plants, pollinator friendly plants, any kind of plants at all is going to help our environment with our pollinators and our birds. Um, so I have a, obviously I have a seed feeder here, uh, but I also have, a, um, this is, uh, was a, uh, uh, Oriole feeder with just the grape jelly in it. Um, and I, right down here on the ground, right next to that little heron, that is my, um, uh, robin feeder down on the ground and uh, it's got the mealworms in it. But this was my garden. It's kind of in the spring. It doesn't look all that exciting. Everything's just getting started. Then it goes into summer, more like late spring, summer. And my, you know, Coreopsis and my daisies are there, the butterfly weed, the, um, the coneflower. So this is summer. That's awesome. But in the fall, it gets really wild looking. And this is just this week in my garden. Okay, so uh, this is uh, 
I have the ability to have a lot of tall plants, and it's really fun. These are called uh, cup plants, and then there's some native coneflower over here. So much fun to watch the birds coming in now, landing on top of the, uh, the coneflower, on top of the cup plant, and especially the goldfinches eating the seeds out of there. Um, and then, of course, the, uh, the coneflower uh, lasts a long time. I also put in uh, I, a new garden area. We decided to expand our garden a little bit more. I want some more fall color in there. You can see back here, here's some Joe Pye weed. But I put a new plant back here, and this is a, actually a lilac tree called a bloomerang. And it is supposed to uh, bloom three times uh, in spring, summer, and fall. Uh, I didn't get any blooms yet this year, so in about two more years, I'll be able to tell you whether that is really happening or not. <laughs> this plant back here is one that I've planted that I moved from a different area. This is another cup plant. Eventually, it'll be as tall as this plant over here, so I'm hoping for a really nice tall plant. So my garden changes all the time, um, and so what you want to do is think about what type of a gardener are you? Are you going to be somebody who doesn't like to have a lot of plants at all. Maybe you could have a few plants. Maybe you wanna be kind of crazy like me. You'll note that the more you get into each yard, um, you know, here's kind of our traditional yard and we're not gonna get that many species. And they don't even have birds on this list. I just thought that was kind of a fun graphic to show us the different kinds of yards that we have. The standard traditional American yard does not offer a lot for our animals and our uh, insects. So, you know, anything you do that you could add in flower wise or uh, even if you have a small space, you have just a small space, put out some pots on your front porch. Here's a beautiful mum plant that I just got from Meyer, and it's actually all three of the mums are, the mum colors are together in one pot. <clears throat> so I thought that was kind of cool. 20 bucks, under $20 at Meyer. And then this is that lantana plant I was talking about. This one, you do have to water throughout the summer, but it will bloom from yeah, with no deadheading from the minute you put it in the ground all the way into fall. So that is a fabulous plant, absolute hummingbird magnet and um, butterfly magnet, too. So if you're not going to go to the big yard, just at least put out a couple of planters. Don't forget to add water. Uh, these are a couple of different water features that I have. One that's out in the middle of the yard, that gets a lot of the big birds in it. This one that's down here at the ground level, we can even plug that in in the winter and make sure that it stays, um, has water throughout the winter. It doesn't freeze over. Uh, a lot of the little birds like this, and my dogs like that one too. And then the one over here is a little closer into the house, a little bit more uh, I guess I'd say secure area. A lot of the little sparrows really, really like this one. These are my hummingbird feeders uh, that I have out. And uh, of course we have suet feeder over here. You can't see it over here, but there's also a suet feeder on that one too. So obviously lots of different types of feed, water options, different kinds of flowers. The more things that you have, if you plant it, they will come. If you put out water, they will come. They might not find it immediately, but they will come. And I'll tell you, we get more action in our backyard from the birds. Um, and then we come to fall. I do not clean out my garden terribly much, a little bit sometimes, uh, but I let all of the dead stuff stand, let the birds eat that. And I do try to uh, uh, keep the leaves down. Um, I, I do get, I tend to, I don't have branch piles necessarily uh, in our yard, but we have kind of a, a nature area behind that we throw them in across the fence. But if you can do it, don't, don't feel like you have to have your garden meticulous. Uh, and that would be my real, uh, my real suggestion for that. Uh, what else did I have here? Oh, yeah, yeah, I definitely want to point out, uh, if you have questions about gardening, you can go to the MSU Extension uh, Gardening in Michigan site. Um, we've talked about this before, I know, but the Smart Gardening section has a lot of lists, a lot of ideas. There's a section on flowers um, that will 
help you to uh, you know, can learn, teach learn about soils and compost flowers, you know, your pollinators, lawns, all sorts of good ideas there. Um, if you have a question specifically about your garden, you can, uh, or one, a single plant or anything, you can go to Ask Extension and submit your question, and someone will get back to you with, uh, and try to give you your answer. You can even, um, attach a photo if you have a question about a plant health or something like that. Uh, I found this a uh, really interesting site. It's called healthyyards.org, and it talks about the 10 healthy steps of things that you can do in your yard. We've talked about a lot of these in the spring. Mow high, avoid chemicals, um, use electric equipment instead of gas, uh, mulch your clippings, um, Choose sustainable plants. By choosing sustainable plants, we mean find the right plant for your type of weather so that it's like, uh, um, you know, that you're you're not getting a plant that's going to take a lot of water all the time. Find things that are native plants tend to take less water. Um, you know, remove invasives, reduce your lawn surfaces, and then also keep it dark at night, which Ellie had already talked about. Uh, so that's kind of a cool site, um, and we'll send out all the links. Uh, but I just want to encourage people to plant flowers when they can, to add in some native plants, and you'll, I'll guarantee you that they will come. So these are just right in my backyard. I've got the bees and the butterflies and an awful lot of birds, too. So, Elliot, I'll let you take it back. Awesome, Cindy. Well, yeah, at our end here, we're just kind of doing a, a whirlwind of resources for you. And um, <clears throat> those MSU gardening resources are really helpful. Um, I also wanted to just point out, so as Cindy said, um, you know, as long as you're not using invasive species, the more diversity you can add into your yard, you know, the better. Now, that being said, if you can use native plants, even better. And if you're looking for some resources on native plants, um, we're, we're not really covering them in depth today because Michigan's a huge state and it has several climate zones and dozens, not if not even hundreds of different types of ecosystems. Um, so you really need to tailor your native plants to your region. But thankfully, uh, the Michigan Audubon has this excellent website um, that I will pop in here right now. And it really has got a wealth of resources for native planting. It has a little info on why native plants can really help. Um, and, and as Cindy said, even non-native plants um, that have flowers and produce nectar, they can sometimes be utilized. Um, but you know, these native plants will produce a lot more uh, food for the environment. And on here, um, you can find a variety of nurseries for your region of the state, hopefully. Um, you know, this isn't comprehensive, but the other resource is uh, conservation districts. And they will sell native plants. Actually, this time of year right now, my local Chippewa Loose Mackinac district is uh, selling bulbs and other things for the fall. So um, that's a great source. You can also find some books out here, like Landscaping with Native Plants of Michigan, which is a great resource that, um, that you can get to kind of learn how to uh, plant the right things. And also make sure you know your invasive. Things like Purple Loose Strife are sold sometimes uh, at gardening centers, and they are not good for the environment. Uh, one more uh, resource is if you have a lot of property, this website here from the DNR is a great resource for how to manage more property scale or acreage scale habitat. Um, and if you scroll down, there is a section on species for songboards, songbirds, bluebirds, grassland, woodland. So if you have, you know, acres, you know, five acres or more, this might be a nice resource, even an acre um, or more to kind of think about more habitat scale rather than just backyard or, or landscape scale rather than just backyard. So, so apologies there, folks. I've been a little tired. I, I've been going through some uh, <laughs> some some colds here. And uh, I do think, though, that we got through everything. And hopefully you found some of these resources helpful. Um, you know, we are really just so excited that so many of you joined us again for a couple more days of, of Birding 101. Uh, we really want to thank you for, for joining us. And we do want to, um, again, give you an opportunity to uh, to fill out a quick survey for us. Uh, this survey helps us with um, learning how to make this course better as well as justifying it. Um, so 
the survey link I'll, I'll share right now in the chat. I just shared it. I'll share it again. And when you leave here too, if you, if you're heading out, the little pop-up will show up to take the survey. So you can click that, you can leave, or we'll email it to you. But again, we just want to say a huge thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope that this has inspired you to love birds a little more and to care for them a little more, um, or, you know, maybe just to share that with others since you already, many of you are already in that passionate state. Um, with that, We've got about 15 minutes, uh, maybe 10 minutes for questions here uh, since we're going to 8.15. So let's do a little Q&A. And remember, if you have questions, throw them in that Q&A section. Yeah, what about uh, bird houses? Um, Stacy says she has a very open backyard and usually removes her houses, but should she leave them out? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, bird houses are an awesome thing you can add to your backyard or to your um, property to add another um, layer of uh, additional resources for the birds. <clears throat> bird houses generally, depending on the species, uh, it's good to clean them in the fall. So you can take out the last year's nest in the fall. Um, depending on the species, you can look up the species of, of birdhouse that you have, but in general, cleaning them out is helpful. Um, I tend to leave mine up, but if you do leave them up over the winter, the downside is they may end up as a mouse home or a chipmunk home or a squirrel home or things like that. Um, and so sometimes other things will take advantage of them. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, our, our small mammals are, are part of our ecosystems too and part of our food webs. Um, so a lot of people do not bring them down, but but if you have the time and effort and energy and you want to kind of maintain those houses, they'll also just last longer if they're not out in the winter. Um, so it's sort of optional. But cleaning them out is a good idea in the fall before they get refilled in the spring. Should hummingbird feeders be left out in the be put out in the open or should they be sheltered near trees? So generally, um, you know, hummingbirds will want to be close to um, protection, so shrubs or trees, um, a covered area, but the feeders themselves are normally placed out in the sun or um, not directly underneath vegetation. Um, because if they're too close, the birds might um, not see a predator that's hiding in that tree or shrub. Uh, and so you, know, you kind of want to put them next to, but not directly underneath vegetation. That being said, um, you, know, you, you can always move them around and try different things. Is where, there where any, do you put yours, Cindy? Oh, yours are um, kind of like that? I, or? Yeah, well, actually, mine was uh, originally I had mine moved in a little bit closer to the house, and it was a little too close to a burning bush that I have there. And yeah, so yeah. We, re we put it out probably another two feet from yeah. there and it got a lot more traffic because a little too close to the to the shrubbery just I think makes the birds a little more nervous I guess so yep and so it is a, it. it is in the sun yeah yeah so you want it out in the open but but not too far not too close you gotta find that sweet yeah <laughs> yeah is there anything else we can do to aid birds during fall migration yeah so you know the the one of the, actually, uh, there's a great link, and I'm trying to see if I drew that in here, um, that is things you can do to help birds. Um, and it's mostly the things we talked about. Uh, you know, as we said, feed the birds, uh, plant native or plant diverse, and those will be huge. Keep your cats indoors, reduce pesticide, turn off your lights at night, and those are some of the primary things you can do. If you want to go above and beyond something I didn't talk about is that you can you can go beyond your yard and yourself and think about supporting organizations that work to protect large scale habitat. Um, it's if everyone in the country dedicated their yard to be animal habitat, we would solve a ton of problems. <laughs> so that's huge. But the other thing is that there's a lot of organizations that work to protect um, you know unpopulated areas or areas that haven't been disturbed yet. So your local land conservancies, the American Bird Conservancy, uh, Audubon and, and Michigan Audubon, these are groups that you can choose to support. Um, also with your purchases, um, things like reducing plastic, purchasing bird-friendly coffee, um, you know, thinking about purchasing foods that are grown in ways that might support more habitat too. Your buying power can be really powerful for helping birds beyond just your own home. 
We have a number of questions in the uh, chat that ask about uh, a recommendation on a bird guide book for Michigan, a book for a beginner birder to help get starting with ID. Um, basically, everybody's saying, hey, beginners or and Michigan. Yeah. So um, if if you didn't attend our, our spring class, um, we have recordings of those and there'll be newer recordings that are a little better coming out soon. Um, but we, we give some recommendations there. It's really what works for you. Um, as I said, the Sibley Guide to Birds is, is my personal favorite. Um, it, it just has a really, really good um, rundown of how to identify birds based on not just color and, 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 uh, pattern, but many other things. I'm trying to pull up some uh, well, that, photos from our yeah, spring one. As, you know, uh, last week, I uh, actually, last week, I sent out a list of uh, bird um, in our, in our follow-up in the, where I sent the video link. Um, so I could actually, yeah, there's, there's your pictures. That's nice. Yeah, I found the picture. So uh, Peterson's is one of the original. Merlin, of course, is, is free. Peterson is a great guide. Sibley is really helpful. And um, I've listed a few others, the Golden Guide, the Crossley ID Guide, the National Geographic. Um, the Kaufman Guide is a great photo guide if you like pictures more. Um, and so you could review that, that, um, that recording to get a few more. Uh, the thing I will say to help a bikini birder, if you're a little overwhelmed, get one that's for the Eastern US only, if you live in the Eastern US. Um, or the Western U U.S. only, because that will take out about, you know, a third of the birds or so, so that you don't have all these birds that you're not going to see here. Um, you can even try to find a regional Michigan specific guide, and that'll narrow the list down even more. Um, so, yeah. And I, I will send out in our follow up email when I send the recording for this one, I will put a couple of links in there that uh, we have. Uh, we don't make res recommendations for specific books, but everybody's got their favorite uh, their favorite birding book. Uh, any recommendations on great places to view migrating birds in Metro Detroit area right now? Yeah, so Metro Detroit has a wealth of birding opportunities. There's actually the St. Clair um, Macomb uh, Birding Trail, and that's got a whole list of places. But Saint Lake St. Clair Metro Park, is an awesome place to go birding. The Lake Erie Metro Park down river has actually a hawk watch and they have a festival coming up here on the September um, 15th and 16th, I believe. And so you can go check out that festival at the Lake Erie Hawk Watch or the Detroit River Hawk Watch, which is at Lake Erie Metro Park. Um, Belle Isle is right in the heart of Detroit and one of my favorite places to go birding. It's got a variety of habitat. It's awesome. Um, so, you know, the Metro Parks, Belle Isle, um, the state parks that are around there, and really anywhere that you could find just a little patch of greenery in a city is going to be a hot spot during spring mic or fall migration. Well, we are almost out of time. In fact, we probably are. But there's one last question. And someone who did not put their name in here said, did I meet you at the UP State Fair last month, Elliot? Probably, possibly. I was there on Sunday. So I was only there Sunday. <laughs> but if you saw me there, I, I do think I remember meeting somebody who took the birding class. So it's always fun <laughs> to see you out and about. <laughs> well, that's a wrap, my friends. Thank you so much for joining us for our fall refresher. We hope you enjoyed. We, Elliot and I always enjoy having the opportunity to get together, talk birds, and also to meet folks who uh, are doing birding themselves. We think that getting out and birding is just one of the best things you can do. It's so much fun, and it's like a treasure hunt outside. So, Hope you all have a wonderful time with your fall and I will be sending out the recording. Don't, don't worry about that. Thank you everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.